Good afternoon, everyone. Um, with me is the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, another familiar face, the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service Medical Director, Dr. Ed Lifshitz. Good to have you both. To my left, another guy who needs no introduction, Superintendent of the State Police, Pat Callahan. We have Chief Counsel Paramel Garg and a cast of thousands. Before we jump in, um, I had a very emotional visit to Carteret yesterday. I had spoken, I, I think, minutes, I, I, I lost track of time on Friday, minutes after the awful fire at the Bristol Station apartment complex um, started. Uh, I spoke with Dan Ryman, the great mayor of Carteret. The police and fire, I think the fire department was there within three or four minutes, Pat. Um, I was with the chief of police yesterday. Both the chief of the fire department and of the police were literally going through the building all weekend on their hands and knees, obviously looking for any uh, casualties. And thank God there were none, which is extraordinary. Um, and But you, you can imagine the building's going to have to come down and just uh, toured the building and then met with a, a lot of the residents. And they're not surprisingly be somewhere between their lives being ruined or, or, or upended, somewhere in, in, in between, wondering if they can get their possessions out. Just a really tough situation. I want to give Mayor Ryman, and I was with uh, Middlesex County Commissioner Director Ron Rios. I want to give them a shout out, both chiefs and their brave colleagues um, for dealing with a really tough situation. And I promised the state would stay in there with the community and the county um, over the next weeks and months, and this will be something that will take uh, a fair amount of time to recover from. So keep them in your prayers, everybody. No policy-related announcements for today, so let's dive right into the numbers. First, um, the Communicable Disease Service at the Department of Health uh, under Dr. Lifshitz's leadership has updated its counts of the fully vaccinated residents who have since tested positive for the coronavirus, either tested positive, entered the hospital because of a severe case, or God forbid who have died due to COVID. This update now covers the lived experience of 4,758,520 people who achieved full vaccination since mid-January. That's when the first recipients reached full vaccination 14 days after their final doses, all the way up in this case through to July 12th. So first, in terms of vaccine efficacy, we continue to see that the vaccines are proving extremely effective across the board. The effective rate of the vaccines is, pro is protecting a fully vaccinated individual against testing positive for coronavirus. It's roughly 99.9% effective. And of those who do test positive after full vaccination, their cases are overwhelmingly proving to be minor, thank God, in scope. The, efficacies, the efficacy of the vaccines against a case of COVID that would require hospitalization continues to exceed 99.99%, and against death, it remains at 99.999%. These numbers are, as I said, based on the real-life experiences of those, that number of folks there, 4,758,520 uh, fully vaccinated individuals. Let's put this, if I can, into a little bit different color. Of the nearly 32,000 COVID positive hospital admissions reported between January 19th and July 12th, more than 99% have been of unvaccinated individuals. In this span, we have also reported to you nearly 5,400 deaths from confirmed COVID complications or confirmed complications from COVID. More than 99% of these were of unvaccinated individuals. And of the 49 fully vaccinated who did pass, God rest their souls, many had other complicating factors which kept them vulnerable to a COVID infection. The one that stands out for me is someone we, we memorialized a few months ago and that, remember, was uh, a transplantee. And her family, remember that Judy, had wanted 
us to underscore the fact that she was a transplantee and, and to make the point that others who are transplantees were under particular or were at particular risk. So again, when you add all this up, you conclude, you have to conclude the vaccines work. The vaccines turn COVID into a preventable disease. Because of the vaccines, this is a pandemic, as we've been saying now for many weeks, among the unvaccinated. The protections they afford to the fully vaccinated cannot be contested. Now, looking to our other numbers, as many other states are experiencing, the spread of the coronavirus among the unvaccinated is increasing, and we are seeing the same upticks in our numbers due to the rapid spread of the highly transmittable and contagious Delta variant. And again, based on what we just reviewed regarding the effectiveness of the vaccines, the numbers we're about to review are almost exclusive uh, to those who are unvaccinated. We are today reporting an additional 594, as you can see, positive PCR tests, another presumed positive antigen test totaling 162. As a couple of points of comparison, um, two weeks ago we were reporting a combined total of 292 additional cases, and on June 26th, a month ago, that number was 272. So we're really beginning to see the increases over the recent uh, term. This is the first time, in fact, since mid-May that we are adding this many cases a day. Throughout the past week, we added 4,875 PCR and 1,678 presumed positive antigen tests to our totals. That averaged, by the way, about 936 cumulative positives per day over the past week. Positivity rate continues to creep up as well. The one-day positivity rate for last Thursday, you can see, is 3.84% over the entirety of the past week. That averaged 3.95%. Again, if you go back a couple of weeks to July 12th, the positivity rate was 1.7%, and a month ago it was 0.88%. So in just one month, we're seeing essentially a quadrupling of the positivity rate. The rate of transmission, as you can see, likewise remains high relative to recent experience at 1.44. However, as unnerving as this increase has been, the increase in hospitalizations is what we are watching most closely. As we have noted since the start of the pandemic, these are the metrics that speak to the ability of our healthcare network to treat those who have COVID-related illness that requires hospitalization. So we have the most amount of people in our hospitals with COVID since June 9th. Over the past week, the number of confirmed COVID-positive patients in our hospitals increased roughly 30% over two weeks ago. Today, the confirmed number is 357. Uh, to give you a sense, last Monday that was 274, and two Mondays ago is 249. And there are also 62 persons under investigation uh, currently hospitalized. The ICU count is 78. That number is also up from last week, up by about 35%. And the number of patients requiring a ventilator is now 33. That's up modestly from 29 a week ago. Over the past week, 366 COVID-positive patients entered our hospitals an increase of about 30% from two weeks ago, while 343 were discharged. The trends we are seeing over the past several days suggest we are not done seeing these numbers continue to rise. Now, thankfully, because the number of fully vaccinated New Jerseyans is so high, we are relatively hopeful we will not return to where we were even a little more than a couple of months ago. <clears throat> In mid-May, we had ICU counts that were hovering around 200 persons, and the ventilator count was hovering at around 100. But we cannot return to where we were in early April when our spring uptick peaked. That was with nearly 2,400 in our hospitals and 4,000 cases a day. But um, I beg you, unless more of you, for whatever reason, uh, have not been vaccinated, step up and receive your doses, these risks will remain. As I noted, we're among the leaders nationally in terms of vaccinations. According to the CDC's data, more than 76% of our vaccine-eligible population, that's everybody age 12 and up, has now received at least a first dose. And this morning, we can report that a total of 5,000 
5 million rather, 240,590 individuals who live, work, or study in our state have now completed their vaccine courses. And by the way, and Judy would want me to say this, and I know she will address it as well, it is absolutely imperative that if you have gotten your first dose of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, that you go back to your, get your second, as that's the only way you're going to reach full vaccination and full protection. When we talk about those 99.9, 99.99, 99.999, .99, those are folks who are fully, fully, fully vaccinated. However, as we all know, no vaccine is yet approved for any child age 11 or younger. So the longer you remain unvaccinated, the greater the possibility that a child, by the way, your own child or one of their playmates, a niece, a nephew, a cousin, a neighbor, can then transmit this virus to you with potentially, sadly, deadly consequences. And that brings us to our next set of numbers. Today, we are reporting with a heavy heart an additional three deaths that are confirmed to have been from COVID-related complications. Over the past week, we have confirmed the loss of 37 more New Jerseyans. And from what we are seeing in terms of the effectiveness of the vaccines, the majority of the recent deaths uh, were preventable. The number of probable deaths has been revised to two, as you can see, 2,719. So between confirmed and positive, we have lost a staggering 26,579 brothers and sisters from our New Jersey family. So one of these blessed souls was lost was this guy in the middle, Jorge Hernandez Sr., age 73 of North Arlington. We lost him back on December 3rd before we had a vaccine. A native of Columbia, he came to Patterson in 1969 to join his father who had arrived several years prior after Jorge's mother passed away to earn money to send back home to support the family. He would make his professional home at a pasta factory in Fairlawn where he would spend several decades before retiring in 2016. Jorge married another Colombian immigrant, Fabiola, and they would have two sons of their own, Jorge Jr. and Oscar, Oscar's a policeman, uh, by the way, Pat, in Englewood. I should also say I, I had an incredibly powerful conversation with both sons, Jorge and Oscar, and that Fabiola, the mom, Jorge Jr. and Oscar were all uh, COVID positive. Uh, and they are, I believe at the moment, uh, in much better shape. In 2013, the couple moved into a new home in North Arlington with enough room where they could live on one floor and Jorge Jr. and his family with his wife Paulina and their sons Jacob and Noah would live on the other. In retirement, Jorge loved spending his time with his grandchildren, both Jacob and Noah and Oscar's daughter Oriana, as well as Valeria, the daughter of Oscar's fiancée Marcella. He would teach them soccer in hopes that they too would root for his favorite club, Atletico Nacional from Medellin. Jorge left that wonderful family behind. They remember him every day, and today we honor him. He came here for a better life and found his American dream right here in New Jersey. May God bless and watch over him and his family he leaves behind. And today we also remember these two guys, Gus Cara George on the left and Manny Makinsela uh, on the right. They passed away six days apart in March. And they weren't blood relatives, but they shared a bond as longtime employees of Linwood Pizza in Fort Lee, and much of that time literally working side by side. Gus, again on the left, was the pizzeria manager and had spent more than 30 years at Linwood Pizza. Manny, the, be the beloved main pie guy, had dedicated roughly 25 years to the business. Manny passed on March 5th at the age of 63. He lived in Hackensack and had come to New Jersey from his native Ecuador several decades ago. He loved being Linwood's head pizza maker, but when he had time away from the oven, he enjoyed a good soccer match and time spent with his family, and that included his wife Blanca and their children Diego, and I had the great honor of speaking with Diego last week, as well as Cecilia, Nancy, Juan, and Anna. Only six days after we lost Manny, Gus, lost his own battle with COVID. Gus was born in New York and raised on our side of the Hudson. He was a graduate of Fort Lee High School. He loved cars and football, 
but moreover, he loved his wife, Cindy, with whom I had a very emotional uh, call last week, and his children, Michael and Nicole. He left them all, along with his son-in-law, Mike, his granddaughter, Ariana, as well as his parents, Patrick and Georgia, his sister, Mercina, and his aunt, Mary. By the way, Gus was only 55 years old, and of all the calls, of the many hundreds of calls I've been a part of uh, with his wife, Cindy, this was among the toughest. We cannot help but think and hope that Gus and Manny are side by side again as they were for so many years at Linwood Pizza. Our thoughts are not just with their family, families, but also with the Messiris family who owns Linwood Pizza and who organized a successful GoFundMe campaign to help both Gus and Manny's families. God bless them all. And before I close, I want to acknowledge another one of the small business leaders who partnered with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to remain strong even as the pandemic raged on around us. Ron Gresco is the owner of Randolph's Soccer Evolution. But Soccer Evolution is more than just a soccer store. Ron and his team, all of whom are players, coaches, or fans, are working to build a love of the beautiful game among his customers and create fans for life. Thanks to the EDA, Ron was able to secure a grant that allowed him to pay the store's expenses, meaning that when the soccer fields of Morris County filled back up, Soccer Evolution would be there to provide everything from uniforms to the ball. I had the great honor of catching up with Ron last week, and I thanked him for all he's doing to keep his community moving, figuratively and literally. And as you know, I'm a huge fo soccer fan myself, so I know where I'm going to be stopping by the next time I'm up in Randolph. You could see uh, both his street address and his email address on there, 500 Route 10 in Randolph. And then the website is SoccerEvolution.com. Check him out. I don't know why we got to this, but um, I determined on the call how old Ron was and it, because he teed up by saying, I'm older than you think I am, but I promised not to give his age out. But he did tell me this. He was married the day after President Kennedy was killed. So this guy's been married since November 23rd, 1963, to give you an idea. He's been around here. And by the way, they started out as a broad sports store and over time have focused down explicitly on soccer. Speaking of broad sports, the Buffalo Bisons have pulled up stakes and are returning to Buffalo. Uh, they wore for several months this summer with great pride the Trenton Thunder uniform as the Toronto Blue Jays uh, AAA team. And remember, the Yankees switched their affiliation from the Trenton Thunder up to the Somerset Patriots, where I had the great honor of going last week. Um, and the Trenton Thunder were left without an affiliation. And, you know, in one of these crazy fallouts from COVID and the Canadian government not allowing sports travel across the border, um, the Blue Jays themselves started in, started in Dunedin, Florida, and then they moved to Solon Field up in Buffalo. And, of course, the AAA affiliate, the Buffalo Bisons, had to find an affiliation, and they came to Trenton. So they pulled up stakes, and if you get a chance, we're going to retweet some of the stuff they said. They were extraordinary, extraordinarily laudatory uh, toward Trenton as a community and toward the Trenton Thunder team, uh, and it's richly deserved. So we should all hope that the Thunder, and they richly deserve it, find another affiliation sooner than later, and we get baseball back into Trenton as it should be. And by the way, that was the first time AAA ball had ever been played in Trenton, which made it particularly cool. The Yankees affiliate was a double A team. Finally, August is just around the corner, and August is also National Immunization Awareness Month. Quite appropriately, National Immunization Awareness Month has been commemorated since long before COVID-19, but this year with the vaccines in our toolbox, it takes on a special meaning. As I said at the beginning, the vaccines are proving to be safe and highly effective. By getting vaccinated, you are not only protecting yourself from a potentially deadly virus, you are protecting your family, and your community. In New Jersey, we have administered the vaccines to more than 5.9 million people, more than 5.7 million eligible folks who live here, uh, and another 150,000 who work or go to school here. They have taken responsibility to helping us end this pandemic. They have taken the step to give themselves more than 99% protection against COVID. If you have not yet joined them, 
do so. Please do so today. So go to covid19.nj.gov slash finder to find a place where near you where you can walk in today and get your first dose. The vaccines are safe, they're effective, and they are free. And Judy, I'm showing today that we have 1,479 locations in our state. There's a location, folks, near you. So let's celebrate National Immunization Awareness Month the right way by getting every New Jerseyan vaccinated against COVID. Let's not lose one more member of our family. And with that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. As the Governor covered, the COVID-19 vaccines available today are very effective in preventing hospitalizations and death. To reverse the increases in the hospitalizations that we're seeing in the cases in our state, we need even more New Jerseyans to get vaccinated. As I have mentioned before, we want to see more younger individuals taking advantage of vaccination. In the age group 18 to 29, 62% have at least one dose. We need that coverage to be higher. Among those 12 to 17, only 44% have at least one dose. Again, we need that coverage to be higher. I want to thank the parents of those younger individuals who are vaccinated, who obviously understand the value of this vaccine. The best thing parents can do to protect the health of their children is to vaccinate them against this virus. Getting their children vaccinated allows them to safely return to schools, to the sports that they enjoy and other activities that they missed out on over the past year. To ensure young adults are fully protected against COVID-19 virus when they return to school, they need to get vaccinated now. I encourage any parent of an unvaccinated 12 to 17 year old to make an appointment for their child today so that they can be fully vaccinated when the school year begins. Visit covid19.nj.gov slash finder or call 855 855- 568-0545 to schedule an appointment. To build greater protection for our state, we need more of the individuals in the younger age categories to get vaccinated. As the governor mentioned, August is Immunization Awareness Month, which highlights the importance of being up to date on vaccinations to prevent serious diseases such as measles, meningitis, and whooping cough. During the pandemic, due to child well visits being delayed, New Jersey saw a drop in immunization rates for young children of about 9% compared to 2019. As children return to school and other extracurricular activities, parents should make sure their children are caught up on all childhood recommended vaccines. Children can get a COVID-19 vaccine and other vaccines at the same time. Routine immunization is vital to reducing the spread of infectious disease in our state. Among children born between 1994 and 2018, vaccinations will prevent an estimated 419 million illnesses, 26.8 million hospitalizations, and 936,000 deaths over their lifetimes. Moving on to my daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 419 hospitalizations of COVID positive and PUIs. Over the past two weeks, that is a 26% increase in patients in our hospitals. Fortunately, there's no new reports of multi-system inflammatory uh, inflammatory syndrome in children. There are 130 cumulative cases in our state. At the state veterans' homes, no new cases among the residents of the homes, and at the state psychiatric hospitals, no new cases among patients. As of July 22nd, the percent positivity in the state is up. Uh, It is 3.84%. The northern part of the state, 3.57%. The central part of the state, 4.67%. And the southern part of the state, 3.05%. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe and let's get vaccinated to protect ourselves, our families, our friends, our children, 
and enjoy a safe, healthy summer. Thank you. Judy, thank you. As always, powerful statistics around vaccinations and what they can prevent. Mm. Ed, I wanted to ask you this a couple of times over the past couple of weeks, but as we adjust the, uh, the number of probable deaths now on Mondays, because that's the day, at least for the time being, that we're gathering here, what is the most common reason of late, say over the past couple of months, that you're adding uh, a loss of life to that list? Probable deaths at this point in the pandemic are almost always those people who have been tested by an antigen test, so they become a probable case and end up dying without having a PCR confirming it. So if you're a probable case and you end up dying, you end up being a probable death. So that's what we're seeing now. Got it. Thank you for that. Good to have you, Judy. Thank you again. Pat, good to have you. We have, it looks like some decent, it's warm, but decent weather. Any, any uh, concerns you got out there? Any other, uh, any other uh, items you got? Great to have you. Yeah, not much to report, Governor, uh, which is a good thing. Always yeah. knocking on wood. Uh, and we do. We have a relatively quiet week uh, with a chance of some showers uh, Wednesday through and thunderstorms when, Wednesday through Friday. But as always, uh, us and the National Weather Service will be watching that closely and we'll uh, certainly put out any alerts should uh, anything rise to that level. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. Um, so bear with me one second. So again, I think we're going to be in the same rhythm that we've been in of late. We'll start with Matt Arco here in the front row. Um, so we'll be here uh, with you on Mondays. Uh, and we will be virtual and I think we'll be, I'm not sure whether or not we're on the road together or not. Um, you and I were on the road for a fantastic event last week on lead mm. pipe, uh, lead service line removal and lead paint removal, which is a game changer. And Judy, thank you for that. It was a, it was a little bit unusual to be with you on a non-COVID uh, topic, uh, but it was a huge step. And, and we're going to be the only state in the nation that does what we signed into law last week, which is, uh, I think, a badge, a, a badge of honor. Uh, but if we're out there, we'll, we'll give you reports from the road. Otherwise, we'll be with you electronically. Matt, good to see you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, last year, many school districts said they could only offer half days in elementary schools because they did not have big enough cafeterias or the staff to keep uh, students socially distanced while they ate lunch. Given those students can't get vaccinated yet, will you again allow school districts to offer half days uh, this year if they can't figure out how to do lunch safely? Of the fully vaccinated who died, can we have a breakdown of ages and pre-existing conditions? And Governor, any consideration of following New York City's lead in requiring vaccines or weekly tests for public workers? Uh, and last from NJPBS, um, with no black bear hunt this year, what's your plan to control the bear population, Governor? Um, oh, loose ball. Uh, as we sit here, Matt, I'll go through, give you my quick um, uh, answers, and then I was going to say I'll turn it over to Ed for the last one. I realize that's on black bear, so I don't think Ed, I'm not going to do that to Ed. Um, uh, at this point, as we sit here, our recommendations that we put out at the end of last month, just about a, a month ago, are recommendations. And importantly, if a school is not able to abide by those recommendations, that is not reason enough. Uh, for them to not be fully open. So the answer is we, we need full days. As Again, I suspect this will be an answer to a number of questions as it has been. The virus dictates the terms here. You know, we, we do our very best. We make our calls based on the science, the data, the facts. We do our best to stay out ahead of this, but we have to keep that in the back of our minds. Um, I, I saw what New York is, is, is doing, and I, I would just reiterate what I just said a second ago. We're, we if you make your decisions based on science, data, medical facts, uh, you have to have all options available. That's just the reality. Um, and, and we'll continue to, and that's, you know, what, what work looks like when we're all back together uh, continues to be something that we're meeting on and, and weighing, et cetera. No, no news on that yet. The, the budget, I'll, I'll switch gears uh, to say the least, the budget, that I signed includes, Paramount will correct me from a million and a half dollars of non-lethal management of the black bear population, everything from hiring more folks to more education uh, to more science uh, associated with this. 
Um, so when I say hiring more folks, I mean literally in, in, in enforcement, uh, law enforcement or safety enforcement. Um, and so that, that's something that, you know, we, we have said from the get-go, we couldn't just end that hunt and not have a plan in place. Um, this is led overwhelmingly by the Department of Environmental Protection. Sean LaTourette, its commissioner, and I had a good uh, discussion and exchange on this uh, last week. Uh, as I say, it's about a million and a half dollars in the budget directed a number of different programs to address the black bear population. Uh, anything you'd add, Judy, and then specifically to the, this is something I think we've promised, but I don't know that we have it yet, uh, any, any, anything on the demographics of the fully vaccinated folks who have lost their lives, either comorbidities, ages, uh, race, ethnicity. I'll have to get back to you on the, on the exact numbers. I will say that the breakdown is more or less as you would expect with uh, all towards the older groups. I do not believe that anybody under the age of 50 died, um, and the majority of them had uh, coexisting conditions as well. But like I said, it's the exact numbers. I'll have to get back to you. And that's something um, that I think a lot of people are interested in, mm -hmm. so we will, we will do that. Sir, behind the camera, either of you guys have anything? No? You're, okay, thank you. Good Hi, afternoon. Don. Good afternoon. This is my first time in person, so it's nice to see you. Um, Where are, just, are you from uh, from Philly or um, from CBS three? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just have one question, Governor. Um, I know there's an effort on the part of some parents to push for you to reconsider having a virtual option for parents, uh, you know, this coming school year. So is that something you're reconsidering and, and why? It, yes or no? Again, welcome. Good to have you. Um, the, the answer is, it, it, as I sit here on this on July 26, 2021, the answer is no. Um, we fully expect to be back to school Monday through Friday, full days, you know, as close to a normal school year as possible. We put out a, a, a very substantial uh, guidance and with Judy's input with lots of recommendations. Um, and we've also said that uh, as it relates to things like masking or other other things of that nature in the public health realm, uh, that superintendents can choose to be stricter than we are. Uh, but we we fully we fully expect uh, that kids will be full time in person. And again, I'll repeat what I said, and I suspect I may say it again. Having said all that, the vac the, the virus dictates the terms here. Um, we we do our best to call balls and strikes based on the facts and to stay out ahead of it. Uh, but that's a reality that we're living with. Nice to have you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Lipschitz, a point of clarification. You said a moment ago that probable deaths, if you're a probable case of COVID and you die, you end up as a probable death counted among those 2,719 folks. Are you telling us that out of all those 2,700 people counted as probable deaths, none of them ever received a positive COVID test? Or is that just a portion of that population? For you, Commissioner Persicelli, obviously we have an increased amount of cases of COVID-19, but I saw just 33 people on ventilators. Uh, my memory might be faulty, but I remember a time back during the first wave when we had as many as a quarter of hospitalized people on ventilators. What do you attribute that to? And does that show that we have some success in treating the virus now that we have almost 18 months of experience with it? For you, Governor, what's the red line at which you would reimpose the indoor mask mandate what In, indoor what sorry mask mandate masking okay so what's the specific metric that you would say gets to x or y that you would say that's it we're putting masks back on and finally your message to unvaccinated folks talking about a pandemic of the unvaccinated it sounds a lot like scare tactics and fear mongering how are you going to reach out to people to try and get them to become vaccinated you tried the beer you tried the wine you tried dinner with you Obviously, you're not getting the amount of vaccination you want to. Is it time to use the carrot or the stick? Uh, I'll start at the top. Uh, very good question, Ed. On the probable deaths, does that mean that the, these folks um, have, have never had a, a, a COVID positive test or, or at least not at the time of their illness, I would think, right? All right. So, so to be a probable death, you first had to be a probable case and then died. 
Um, earlier on in the pandemic, most of the probable deaths, essentially all the probable deaths, were people who died in outbreaks in long-term care facilities and other places who had symptoms that were compatible with COVID and never got tested because testing wasn't readily available at that time. As we've gone forward in time and testing has become more readily available, the large majority, and I don't know the exact breakdown because there are going to be some still in other groups as well, but most of what's happening is those probable deaths are probable cases because they've had an antigen test and they subsequently died. There still will be some of the other types of people mixed in there as well, but as I said, I don't know the exact breakdown, but certainly uh, the majority are going to be there. Judy, I, 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 that was a good, good question, and the question on vents I think is a good question. So we, we're dr dramatically different place 16 months ago. But even today, the percentage, you and I, you said this on our call earlier, has dropped. Yeah, the uh, percentage of individuals on ventilators today is 42 percent, which is, I think, one of the lower percentages that we've had in quite some time. So we have about 78 uh, individuals in intensive care, but uh, only 42 percent on vents. That's a, that's a real difference from um, even a short time ago uh, when our cases were lower. So we are seeing, I think, the impact of vaccinations on severe disease. It's not as severe, uh, although they are in intensive care. They wouldn't be there if they were not extremely ill, but only 42% on ventilators. Um, I think that's a, that's a fairly good number. Good, good questions. I, I think on the red lines, Alex, it's a, it's a collection of data points. It isn't one. Um, and it's the ones that we talk about every day, but the one that we were discussing on our call earlier, and, and Judy alluded to this, is we just cannot remotely run the risk of our healthcare systems getting overrun. That's the big one. Uh, and we're not close to that, thank God. We're not even close. Paramo was reminding me. We're, we're dramatically better than we were in April, and we're even more dramatically better than we were in January. So while the numbers are up, and we don't like that, they're up from a very low level. I think you mentioned that Florida has 6,000 people in the hospital. God, God bless them all with COVID right now. So uh, we are, you know, I'm knocking on wood that it stays that way. Um, that's partly why national um, solutions for the most part uh, make sense, but you've got di very different realities depending on where you are in the country right now as it relates to vaccination rates. Um, I w it's not scare tactics, it's, um, and, and I mean that. That's not, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to be very blunt, though, about what the data is, and the data is overwhelming. Um, when you're talking 99.9 percent, .9%, then 99.99 percent .99 you won't go to the hospital, or 99.999 percent that you won't die. Folks have to hear that, and, and that's, that's the reason why we're saying this. They have to understand what they're dealing with here. And as it relates to other efforts, we continue like door knocking. We're in 33 communities. Um, we continue to need to make progress, as Judy reminds us always, on both black and brown communities where we're making progress, but we're not where we need to be. So I think 26 of those 33 communities off the top of my head are black or brown majority communities. Um, we had a meeting on other contests, other incentives earlier today that we might put back out there. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we'll continue to play with that. The big winner, I mean, the door knocking program has been a huge winner. My guess is at a certain point, and we may be there, that it has some amount of diminishing returns, but you're still, we're still getting take up by the thousands every day. Uh, the state park, the free vax pass has been the overall, the overwhelming contest winner. Dinner with Tammy and me was not a bad, not, not a bad uh, uh, distant second place. So we'll, we'll continue to look at that stuff. Thank you. I assume you're good. Ashley, is that you? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, in regards to the Delta variant, are you comfortable with New Jersey's stockpile of PPE? And is the Department of Health monitoring the PPE in hospitals and other um, health care facilities? Um, on the bill that requires census data to be adjusted so that incarcerated individuals will be counted in their hometown and not the municipality where uh, the president is located for congressional redistricting, are you prepared to say that you're going to sign or veto the bill before August 16th when the U.S. Census releases its data? And in the new, is New Jersey ready for early voting? Um, 
our electronic poll books uh, working, being, working and being tested. And um, Terry McAuliffe promises broadband internet to every Virginian by the end of 2025. Are you prepared to make the same promise? Um, Pat, tell me or Judy if you disagree, but I th we feel very comfortable with our stockpiles across the board right now. Would you agree? I would agree with that, Governor. Yes, sir. Um, so everything from vaccine supply to PPE to ventilators, beds, we still have the field medical stations mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the warehouse ready to go. God forbid, please, God, we don't need them. Uh, no insight on the census bill other than I continue to be extremely thankful that we put the amount of energy and money into uh, getting as complete a count as we got. Um, nothing on that yet. No update on early voting, but I, I think the key point will be, will we be ready to go um, when we need to be? And the answer to the overwhelming best of my knowledge is yes. Uh, I don't know that I've got any other insights into that. I had not seen Terry McAuliffe's um, uh, commitment, but that is at least conceptually something that uh, we like a lot. As you know, we, we put an enormous amount of energy into closing the digital divide, um, and we closed it from 231,000 last August to zero uh, midway through the school year. Um, I was up in, in uh, Sussex and Warren County a few weeks ago and talking about uh, broadband access for everybody. You know, even though we are the most densely populated state in the nation, there are still uh, too many pockets in our state where the internet connectivity is unacceptable uh, or even unavailable. So conceptually, that's something that we like a lot and we'll, we'll stay on it. I have to ask uh, my friend from the Phillies, do you have a question or are you good? You're good, okay. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, Governor. Trish Hartman from 6ABC. Hi, Trish. Hi. Uh, so this weekend, Dr. Fauci said... May I just say a big Philadelphia presence here today? I just want to make, the rec make that point, please. Go, Phillies. Uh, Dr. Fauci said this weekend that the CDC is actively considering recommending that vaccinated people wear masks in public. If the CDC makes that recommendation, will New Jersey fall in line in recommending their residents to do the same? Uh, you mentioned that kids 12 and under cannot be vaccinated yet. You also mentioned that schools are required to be open for full days this fall. Um, why not require those unvaccinated students to wear masks in school? Um, and then finally, uh, in light of the Delta variant, uh, are, is, are testing efforts going to be ramped up as numbers continue to climb? Do we need more testing in the state? Thank you. Thank you. Good to, good to have you here. Um, I saw what Dr. Fauci said. Um, obviously, the CDC matters a lot to us. I think I said this in, at the tail end of my answer, Alex, to you. Um, you know, we largely look to the CDC for a lot of the guidance. Sometimes we'll slow roll something. So, for instance, when they announced in uh, early to mid-May they were going to lift the indoor masking mandate, we held on to that for another 15 days and I think prevented a, a fair amount of illness. Um, the answer is we always take that into consideration. But I also said in, in uh, the tail end of my answer to Alex, um, I also think you have to take into account the reality of what your state looks like. Um, and a national recommendation may or may not be consistent with the facts on the ground. Um, and so that's something that we always you know, consider and, 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 and look at. And again, the, may I just go back to this, please get vaccinated. The more people we get vaccinated, the easier these decisions are going to be and the, the fewer public health parameters we're going to have to put in place um, to allow us to live our lives as normally as possible. I'd say the same thing probably, Trish, as it relates to under 12 masking. I'd, like, I'd love uh, Judy and Ed to come in on, both, on all three of these. Um, and we feel comfortable, again, with our recommendation. But we have allowed, again, I don't... I, 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 would use New York City as the example here, one monolithic school district for, for hundreds of thousands of kids. We have over 600 districts, and, and that has served us well in this pandemic. Serves us well generally, but in the pandemic, and you can allow a district to be, based on the local realities, you can allow a, a district to lean in more strongly than our recommendation. Testing capacity is pretty high as it is. So I just looked last Thursday, we had, Judy, 25,433 tests. It's, it's running the mid 
to high 20,000s a day on weekdays and 10 to 15,000 on weekends. Um, so I think we got the testing capacity that we need. I guess, Judy, anything you'd add to either masking generally or kids? Um, and then lastly, anything else you'd recommend or observe on the testing front? Yeah, I, th I think on testing, uh, overall average is 32,000 a day about. That's down from about 45,000 during our peak. So we really do want to get that up again uh, in the last uh, week, each region of the state increased their testing between 6 and 10 percent. That's north, central, and south. And so it's going in the right direction. Testing is the best thing uh, we have in anticipating um, isolation of individuals that um, perhaps need to be isolated or quarantined, depending on uh, what the contact tracers do. So we have good level if we'd like to get it higher. And as far as masks are concerned, um, you know, we feel that uh, at this point it's individual responsibility. Um, you know who you're with, and if you're around a lot of unvaccinated people, just try to protect yourself. Judy, on, uh, on masking, by the way, I should note that we have recommended that if you're not vaccinated, you should be wearing a mask inside. Um, and, and secondly, let's not hold it against folks, we've said this many times, who choose to wear a mask. Now, we're, we're wearing masks in this building because it's a state building and that's the requirement. And it is on planes, trains, buses, hospitals, long-term care, um, uh, prisons, other vulnerable locations. Uh, but I was in Newark, uh, Judy, both days this weekend, and I, and Ed, I was struck by the amount of mask wearing, mm -hmm. voluntary mask wearing, uh, including folks who are outside. Let me ask you one on testing. Um, good question from Trish about do we need to have more testing? We're still testing among the highest of any American state, but it's always better to know what the facts are, and then you can make more intelligent decisions. When you say we want to get testing up, is that uh, that's less that we don't have enough capacity or that we don't have, have enough locations? It's far more individual decisions to if they're symptom. I assume in particular if they're symptomatic or they think they've been exposed to a group of unvaccinated folks, they should go get tested. Especially if you've been in a group, uh, if you've been vacationing and you've been with a group that you don't know, uh, get yourself tested. And, you know, I really recommend everybody get tested before they go back to school. Um, we know that a lot of the colleges and universities are mandating vaccinations, which is a good thing. Um, so, uh, you know, just t personal responsibility. We know enough about this virus at this point to be able to do that. I, I would also add uh, a different way to say that, common sense, huh. right? right? If yeah. you're Right? If you're with a bunch of people, particularly if you were indoors and you, you're not sure of their vaccine status. Um, by the way, if you choose to wear a mask, that's a, we shouldn't hold it against you. But if, you've done, if you haven't and you want, want to check it out, get tested. I'm doing a lot more in-person stuff. I'll give you my own personal example. I'm doing a lot more in-person stuff, campaigning, things like that. So now I'm getting tested every Monday. I just got tested. I'm negative, by the way, uh, this morning. Should have probably told you that before I got in, Pat. Uh, so I think people just using their head would be great. Dave, take, take us home here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Um, one comment before the questions. Um, Alex did sound slightly like Darth Vader, so I would like to know if there is any consideration to seeing what kind of mask he's wearing. Um, <laughs> I'll have no comment on that, Alex. Um, with regard to the... Oh, boy. With regard to the last comment about, um, you know, testing, should people who don't feel sick get tested at this point? Would that be a good idea? Would that be something that you guys would recommend? Um, Governor, on the uh, point that was made about your being blunt uh, versus scare tactics, we've had a couple of people who have said, oh, the governor is trying to pit one group against the other. There are other people who might suggest that you're actually trying to save people's lives. Could you comment on what your motivation is and maybe flush that out a little bit more for us? With regard to schools, there's some data that suggests that younger children not only very rarely get sick with COVID, but they're not passing the virus nearly as much as uh, older people. Um, and that illness may be extremely mild and that the people, the adults there around are not getting sick. Maybe, Dr. Lifshitz, you would want to comment on um, 
what we know and don't know about kids, COVID-19, and wearing a mask. And then also, Governor, you had mentioned that uh, with regard to this group, there's a group, I believe, called New Jersey Parents for Personal Choice. They want to have the right to do a virtual versus an in-person situation. Could you explain why you feel so strongly that this is not a good idea? Thank you. Um, several. Uh, I, I will have no uh, reaction to the Star Wars uh, theme at the outset. Um, so remember, this feels like five lifetimes ago. Uh, early on in the pandemic, so March, April, May of last uh, year, uh, we said, listen, the worried well, remember that phrase, we haven't used that in a while, the worried well should not be getting tested because we had enormous constraints nationally, frank, frankly, globally, on testing supply. And Judy, I'm going to answer this. You, you and Ed have to come in and uh, either uh, validate or, or, or uh, disagree. I think it's different now. Um, and this is one guy's opinion, but tell me if you, uh, how you react to this. I think if you're symptomatic, that's reason to get tested. Why is it different, by the way? We know a lot more, and more importantly, we have a lot more supplies than we, did, we had then. We, we do not have a testing supply shortage, which we had last spring. I think you get tested for two reasons. One is if you've got symptoms. And by the way, if you've got symptoms, whether you've got COVID or not, you should be taking, like, just like the old days, take yourself off the field if you've got a fever or whatever it is. And the other is the example we just used. No symptoms, but you know what? I was inside with a packed room full of people, and I'm not sure how many of them were vaccinated. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the Yankees a couple of months ago, the White House, I believe, last week, and there are other examples of summer camps or parties where folks were testing positive just because they were on a regular rotation, not because they had symptoms. Are you generally okay with that? Yeah, I think, I think we, we have to own the fact that the, the, what we know, the Delta variant is highly transmissible. So that alone, um, if you're under the circumstances that the governor just articulated, um, get motivated, get tested, see how, so you don't pass it on to anybody else. And again, in my own case, that's why I'm, I'm doing it. It's just because I was out there a lot this, this over the past number of days. Definitely not trying to pit one group of people off against another. That, that's not the point here. Uh, and we've come out of, I don't want to get political, but we came out of, you know, at least as governor, three years of dealing with that every day. And thank God um, we're not having to deal with that every day, uh, at least to the extent we did. This is absolutely about keeping people healthy and saving lives. Um, we don't want to, I don't want to have to make any more phone calls to families. We don't have to talk about, we just want this thing to end. And there's one way it ends right now. One way and only one way, and that is to get vaccinated. Um, and, and again, there, there are some people who are relying on talking heads or social media who are just wrong about this. And, and th th that's costing people's, uh, their health and, 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 please God, their lives. But there are a lot of people, I'm going to use a number, tell me if I got this number right, of the remaining unvaccinated in New Jersey, over half, I think you said 57%, um, are, open, are open to getting vaccinated. So there's a big, hard-to-reach, what I would call legitimate population. Um, so of the of the whatever it is, 25% left in the state that's eligible. There's a block of folks who I just don't agree with, but we want to keep them alive, uh, whether we agree with them or not. But there's a, another block who that don't speak English. They think it costs money. They think their immigration status will be outed. They work three jobs. They don't know where the location is, which is why you know, the contests are helping, but the grind of just going door to door. Um, I'll let uh, Ed and Judy either add or, or correct that, but also address the question that you asked about kids. And I think from this guy's perspective, you got it right. Kids are just not getting sick at, the, at a level that adults have been, uh, although the needles moved a little bit in the, a little bit south, um, and also trans, transmission. Dave, the last thing on virtual, Assuming we have confidence that we can keep people healthy, uh, whether that's kids, educators, staff, moms and dads and family when they go home at night, um, if we have confidence that we can keep them healthy, 
by going to school the regular old-fashioned way. We know the results on virtual learning, and there's enormous learning loss. I mean, there are some exceptions where I've heard stories, anecdotes. My Johnny or Sally did better. That, that, those are the overwhelming minorities uh, of experiences, and in particular with underserved communities where there was already an embedded institutional, uh, due to all the reasons we know, uh, lear learning loss and needing to catch up, it was even more acute. So assuming we can keep everybody healthy, and we do have that uh, confidence right now, and again, we're watching this like a hawk, uh, there's no question where the, the richer educational experience is, and that is full on in person. Any comments, Judy or Ed, about kids uh, um, or more and any of the other questions, David? Sure. Let me start by talking somewhat about what you've been talking about here as far as, okay, I'm vaccinated. If I'm vaccinated, I'm protected. If I'm protected, why should I ever wear a mask? Why should I ever get tested? Isn't that what the vaccine's supposed to do is protect me so I don't have to worry about those things? And my answer to that is, you know, we've talked over and over again how about the vaccines are excellent, and they are indeed excellent, but they're not perfect. And I saw a good analogy in the New York Times over the weekend where somebody was talking about being vaccinated is not like having an umbrella out when it's raining. You know, I expect that umbrella is going to keep me dry if, on most days, but if there's a hurricane out there, it's not going to keep me dry. Similarly with the vaccine, I'm fully vaccinated. In a room like this, I'm comfortable. I do not think that I'm putting myself at risk. But if I was in an area where I thought it was raining a whole lot heavier, like in an indoor area where I think there may be a lot of unvaccinated people around me, I'm going to be more concerned and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to tend to wear my mask, and if I'm in that situation, I'm going to tend to get myself tested. I'm going to tend to get myself tested in addition if I'm going someplace where I'm really concerned about the person I'm going to see so in addition to myself, meaning the very good news is that most people who are vaccinated, if they get ill, do not get very sick doesn't mean that they can't spread it and doesn't mean that if they're around somebody who's more vulnerable it, they might have a much worse outcome so certainly if I'm going somewhere where I think I might be putting other people at risk I'm much more likely to get tested similarly when we talk about who should get tested well that's what I'm going to get tested you know unvaccinated people well they're not having that umbrella they're more at risk every day of becoming infected you know what wasn't mentioned here is we've always continued to recommend that on return to travel outside of the tri-state area unvaccinated individuals should quarantine themselves and should get themselves tested because they've put themselves at greater risk just by the, the very act of traveling. Um, so that's, you know, kind of my general philosophy as to who and when should get tested. You know, and as has been mentioned, any time where you're not sure, you know, if you think you're nervous, if you're, well, you know, I've been going out to the clubs and next week I'm going to visit my grandmother in the nursing home or I'm going to this big wedding. If there's a doubt in your mind, go ahead and get tested. That's always going to be the better way to go. As far as children go, you know, what's been said over and over again is that, yes, the good news is that in general they do very well. Um, they tend not to get as ill if they do become infected. And in fact, um, we still don't have a great idea exactly how many have ever been infected because they tend not to get tested as often because they tend not to get as ill. So uh, we often don't know about them. Uh, so that is the very good news when it comes to children. When it comes to children and protecting them, and whether it's protecting them by wearing masks and whether that mask is in the classroom or that mask is uh, at gatherings or, or supermarkets or other places, you know, we protect them for two reasons. We look to protect them because, well, we don't want them to get ill and because also we are concerned that they can pass that illness on to others. And while it is still not entirely clear as to whether they pass it on as often as older people do, um, it is clear that they certainly do sometimes pass that along. So we do want to protect the children as much as possible so that they can't pass it on to other people. They also need to live lives. You also need to be able to go to school. You also need to balance those things out and do it as safely as possible. I'm going to kind of end on, on that middle group, you know, you have those adolescents, those people who are now eligible, you know, the 12 year olds and, and up through the 20 year olds, many of whom don't get vaccinated because they basically feel, well, that group in general feels invulnerable, but in particular, they know that when they get ill, they probably won't get as ill as others. And they do worry sometimes about side effects and other things related to the vaccine. Well, first thing is what I've been talking about before, by protecting them, you're protecting the other people out there. 
And I know I would feel awful if one of my kids who could get vaccinated now did not get vaccinated, they got ill and ended up passing it along to somebody else who had a bad outcome. Because again, you know, the inconvenient truth is that every one of these people that we show every day up here who has died got infected by somebody else. And that person had no intention of infecting them. And they themselves may not have been very ill to have passed it along or they probably wouldn't have gotten to see them in the first place, but that's what happens. So by protecting yourself, you also protect the other members in your community, the much more vulnerable members of the community, and that's extremely important. And, you know, the, well, the single biggest endorsement I, I can give to vaccinating that group is I have three children, 18, and as of yesterday, up to 24 years old. And as soon as the vaccine was available, they got it. I mean, and, and uh, you know, there's never any question that they would, and there's never been any question in my mind or in their mind that that was the right thing to do. So again, you know, we can talk about exactly how vulnerable, exactly how likely younger children are to get sick, how sick that they get, but the bottom line is still the same. We want to do everything we can by getting everybody who's eligible to get vaccinated now. When vaccine becomes more widely available, I hope they will get vaccinated as well testing frequently, particularly if you're not sure, and protecting yourself as much as possible. Ed, thank you. That was a tour de force. I just want to add a couple of quick points as we break. Um, you heard Ed say this, so if you've got you know, folks who should, where there should be a real blinking yellow light to think about testing and or whatever, however you behave uh, in any of the public health parameters that we talk about all the time, if you've got someone in your world or you're going to see somebody who's immunocompromised, that probably should be a blinking yellow light. Um, we didn't discuss, uh, because it's, it feels like the jury's out, again, back to Trisha's question about Dr. Fauci. Uh, he also talked about uh, the discussion of the so-called booster shot, um, which is to be determined. But in the places where they're doing the booster shot, Israel being the uh, the, the prime example, it's folks who are older or with comorbidities. So that sort of tells you. And Pat reminds me, there's still a, a, a people out there who think because they had COVID, they don't need to get vaccinated. And the fact of the matter is, unless you disagree, uh, the, the, the science is extremely incomplete on that uh, in terms of antibodies and protection. And you, you should still get vaccinated, even if you've had COVID. We can't say that more strongly enough. I assume you all agree with that. So, Judy, thank you. Ed, I'm going to mask up here. Pat, as always, thanks for that reminder. Paramel, Mahan, cast of thousands. Sarah had the mic today. Thank you. Um, again, thank you all. We will be back here, unless you hear otherwise, a week from today um, at the same time. Um, again, our plea continues to be, and by the way, over, by overwhelming numbers and majorities, everybody out there is doing the right thing. I was in a few restaurants this weekend. Thank God they're back to normal. Um, people, there's a real energy all over the state. Uh, and folks getting vaccinated and before that or now still getting tested and just doing the right thing. Overwhelmingly incredible behavior, unlike any American state. But we desperately need more of you to get vaccinated. And it's not an us against them. I'm glad you asked that. This is, pl please believe me, whether we agree with you or disagree with you on you name it, we're trying to keep as many people healthy and alive as we can. I'm begging you, please get vaccinated. I promise you um, it'll be a great payoff for you, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. They work, they're safe, and you're going to be protected. Thank you all. God bless. <laughs>